Good morning and welcome to Journey Church Online. I'm Pastor Ron. Before I get going, I want to give a big old shout out to all of our moms. Whoever you are, however it is played out for you, happy Mother's Day. I recognize too that a lot of moms are out there that are dealing with burdens and kids and struggles and it's not as joyful as a time. A lot of moms out there have been moms for others. All of the creative ways that God has used you, uh, where you need help or prayer, we think of you today. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. We are with you. Hey, for the next few weeks, we want to wrap up our teaching through Ephesians by going through a series on spiritual warfare. This past week, as I woke up on Monday and it continued on to Tuesday, I was really struggling with getting ready for this weekend, this teaching right here. And uh, on Tuesday morning, I went through my regular routine. I get up early, feed the dogs usually, and then I'll go to uh, my Bible reading and then an app that I use to listen to God's word and then respond to it just through some contemplation and interaction with God. I went into prayer after that and asked God, hey God, would you help me with this coming weekend's teaching? I'm struggling with it. I'm struggling with this time still. I miss you guys. Can't wait to get back. Um, and I'm telling him all these things and uh, asking him to help me. There's a lot in this passage to look at over the coming weeks. It has grand, great implications for our lives. And so I'm asking him for help. Now, moments after that, I get a text from my mom who said that she loved me. I love you, mom. Happy Mother's Day. And then she said she was praying this prayer for me. It's from Ephesians 6. It's at the end of the chapter. We'll get there in a few weeks. And she said from chapter 6, verse 19, and pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan. And I thought about that for a moment after saying, thank you, mom, and receiving that for myself. It's God reminding me, that we are in a spiritual battle, that a lot of things that are happening have bigger things behind them. Maybe not everything, but a lot of them do. And Paul is gonna highlight that in chapter six of Ephesians. He tells us throughout Ephesians, we have looked at it this way, that it's a clash of cultures, that two kingdoms are colliding together, God's kingdom and the kingdom of the enemy. And it's a fight for who will win. Now, we know who has won the ultimate battle, but we believe that we are daily in some spiritual warfare, a spiritual battle. So Paul wants us to understand that. He writes then in verses 10 through 13 concerning this spiritual battle, he teaches us how to engage in it, and he writes to awaken us to action. This is kind of like his Spartan speech to wrap up the letter. So I want to look at the first four verses of this portion. It's chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. He writes, a final word, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the rulers and authorities and the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, because of that, he says, therefore, because of that, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then he says, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Now, let me give you these few thoughts for today, just to get us rolling for the next few weeks concerning this portion of scripture and this spiritual warfare. Number one, we need to understand that we fight a real spiritual battle. 
We should not be alarmed, but alert to this reality. We know that the ultimate battle has been won by Jesus on the cross through the resurrection, but there is still daily spiritual warfare. Even like my mom did in small ways, big implications through prayer, through other pieces of armor that we'll talk about over the coming weeks that we need to put on. Now, within it, as we look at this, we do need to understand that we need balance in it. What do I mean? C.S. Lewis would write about this when he would say, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, on one end, we give no credit to the enemy, that he doesn't even exist. On the other end, we give too much credit to the enemy that he's behind everything. The devil made me do it. So we take no responsibility. What we need is a healthy balance in between, knowing there is an enemy at work, but a greater God to overpower him. So we need to be reminded that we are fighting a spiritual battle. It's real. Two, Paul writes to us that we need to fight to stand firm. This means to refuse to change a decision or position. This is resistance to the enemy and perseverance in the fight. This is courage and strength to stick with the purposes of God. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says these words. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Why? So you can work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Now, Paul doesn't tell us these things for us to dominate the world, but to, to live out the divine purposes of God. This is why we stand firm, to live those things out. The enemy comes and attempts to destroy those divine purposes. Jesus recognized this and spoke on it in John 10.10, 10, one of the Gospels, when he said, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them, us, followers of him, a rich and satisfying, an abundant, he would say a full life. This is where we are in the fight with God for the souls of the lost, an abundant living for God's people. This is us as a church, and thank you. You have helped us do that. This week, I've heard of people that have never gone to church before that start watching online are going to come back to the building at least when we return. Someone has given their life to Jesus and wants to get baptized. You are helping us stay on mission through your prayer, your support, your giving, your love, your encouragement, your watching, your engagement with us. What is that mission? What's well, God's? To help lost people find Jesus and be formed more into the likeness of him by him. The enemy then comes in and we need to stand firm because he wants to overpower and destroy that. So we need to be empowered. So we are in this fight and we fight with God's strength, not just to stand firm, but we fight it in God's strength. This is where Paul writes and says, be strong in the Lord, in his mighty power. Now, when you study this out, it means not only be strong in the Lord, but keep on being strong. This is something we don't just pray about one time and we get. This is an ongoing spiritual battle. So we need an ongoing strength from God. It's God's battle. It is God's strength. In fact, we'll see in just a moment, reality is it's God's armor that we're putting on. Now, I love this part because it also shows us that we fight in God's strength, but that we're not alone. When you decide to follow Jesus, you join a community of believers worldwide that rally around you through one of our greatest weapons, prayer, through other pieces of armor they put on. 
you realize that you are not alone in this fight we are in. And even more, you are not alone because God is with you. This is God's battle, God's fight, God's strength. So my question is, where do you get, where do you find who is, what is your strength? Are you trying to fight some of these battles we find ourselves in, in your own strength? Are you fighting it with God's strength? We will talk about some of that over the following weeks in this series. But we also do this. We fight in God's strength, but we also fight, Paul says, in full armor. Now, again, we will talk about this the following three weeks in depth. But picture, as Paul would have and the people would have, a fully equipped Roman soldier who is fully equipped to engage and fight. Because this is a battle, Paul writes. It's a struggle. It's described as wrestling, combat. So we need to have a complete set of armor. Why? Because every part you'll see in the coming weeks has a purpose to it. I really needed my mom to come before the Lord in prayer on my behalf this week. For these are a defensive and offensive pieces of armor that we'll look at. So you need the full set. We also, as I said earlier, realize that it's God's armor. Now I'm not going to go fully into this right now, but in Isaiah 59, we read a description of the armor that God has on and we realize that we do it in his strength and it's his armor that we're putting on. I love that. Second Corinthians 10, three through five says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Ah, this is so important. Now, I want to give you a quick thought to think about. And I want you to come back on Monday at noon and Thursday at noon and connect with me, engage with me during our sermon extra. I want to talk about this idea that I won't go into right now, but it is really a great reality and something to understand concerning spiritual warfare. Sometimes we are in the right fight, but we have the wrong armor. And sometimes we have the right weapon, but in the wrong realm. Let me throw out David and Goliath, Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus when he grabs a sword and cuts off a Roman soldier's ear. While we need to, to learn to fight in the right realm with the right armor. Now we'll come back to that. Join me on Monday and Thursday at noon for our sermon extras or watch on our website or app later on. We also learn from Paul this, that we fight against the schemes, the strategies of the enemy. So Paul brings this fight up and he then describes who and what we are fighting. These schemes, strategies of the enemy, which brings up a couple things. Let me go into this and break it down. One is we will learn and talk about, and let me mention today that we need to know our enemy if we believe there's an enemy, we're in a spiritual battle, we need to know enough about him so that we can counterattack him or resist him. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, why do we do that? So that Satan will not outsmart us. We become familiar with his evil schemes, his strategies. Why? 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So we need to recognize these things because he's deceptive and wants to deceive us and get us off purpose and mission for God. Now, here's something we understand about the enemy that is very important, this fight. This fight is about Satan. People are not the enemy the devil is. So we don't minimize the work of the enemy, but we also De also don't demonize or destroy people. Jesus, when he uh, taught through the Gospels and encountered and engaged spiritual warfare, he showed us how to do it in the Gospels. We see that he always looked at what was behind the person. I love that. 
So there's times when he would engage certain types of people and he saw the work of the enemy behind them and he would address that and deal with that. So for example, even one of his followers, Peter, Peter encounters Jesus when Jesus says, hey, who do you say that I am? And Peter would reply, you are the son of God, the savior, the Messiah, the one who has come to rescue and save us. And Jesus would go, Peter, that's it. That is what I'm going to build the church on. That's the rock. That's solid. And then Jesus would say, in addition to that, they're going to kill me because of all that. And then Peter would go, no way. I'll never let that happen. That's not going to happen. And Jesus would say, if you're familiar with the story, you know, get behind me, Satan. He's not calling Peter Satan. He sees what is at work behind him. Wow, that is important for us to know. Why? Because when we're in a spiritual battle and it's with uh, and engaging with people, we can see what's behind it. So then it helps me love and show grace to people while recognizing the work of the enemy. So not only do we need to know the enemy, but we also need to know his strategies, his schemes. Let me just give you a few. We'll look at specifics again over the following weeks. One, he desires to destroy you. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. Stay alert. Maybe Peter wrote this thinking about what happened in the past. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a big old meowing kitty cat. Ready? No, he doesn't. The Bible says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I have a cat, Noah. Noah, every day, morning and night, comes to the door, meows real loud. I don't open the door and he attacks me. He runs in, goes to his food, eats, get, gets in his cat tree and goes to sleep till he goes out at night and hunts mice. This is not Noah we're talking about. This is a roaring lion who wants to devour you. He desires, the enemy does, to destroy you. The other thing he does, it says in Ephesians, actually, is that he looks for footholds. I know sometimes my cat in the office wants to get in. And if he can't because the door's locked, he'll stick his hand under it and move it around and I can see it. If I want to let him in, I can. If I don't want to let him in, he's going to keep doing that. But we think of this foothold as this. If I open the door in this spiritual warfare, this foothold is if I open the door to see who it is and it's someone I don't want in, they stick their foot in the door so when I try to shut it, they can't. That's a foothold. Now you've let an opportunity to come in. The devil, the enemy, a strategy is to look for footholds. Ephesians 4.27, this book, this letter we've been looking at, says concerning anger. Here's one of many examples. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. It lets him come in. So I remember singing this song in youth, you know, 20 years ago. Shut the door, keep out the devil. The other thing the enemy does is he blinds the minds of the unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. What he does is he blinds those that don't believe. He makes them not able to see the truth of who Jesus is. When God wants to reveal and how we live, we talked about this the previous weeks, reveal and what God does and who Jesus is, the enemy wants to come in and hide that. He also then, it says, steals God's word from you. Jesus used it in a parable uh, in this way with a farmer sowing seed. In Matthew 13, 19, he said, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. 
then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. One of the things that he wants to do is as you read God's word, he wants to snatch it away from you so that you'll be thinking about other things, seeing other things. So many of us will find that the word of God is key to what we're doing and how we're living. The enemy wants to steal that away from you. The last thing I want to bring up, and again, there's many more that we'll look at, is that he sets traps to capture you, snares. 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26, then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. One of the things that he does is sets traps and snares to capture you and bind you and keep you in bondage. I wonder today if any of those things resonate with you. Is there anything that you could, through our different platforms, Church Online and our app, if you could go to Facebook, let us know how we can pray for you. Is there any place where there's a foothold? You've been ensnared, trapped, you're captured, and we can come alongside and help you, pray for you, offer counseling. We have classes that are going on online. Celebrate Recovery is doing Zoom meetings. There are ways to help you as the enemy is trying to fight with you. And maybe you've already failed in some way. Don't give up. Jesus is bigger and greater. So we need to know our enemy and his work. But even more than that, we need to know Jesus and his ways. So let me wrap up with him. We fight knowing that Jesus has already won the war, the battle in the earthly realm and the heavenly realms. Evil, death, and sin have been defeated. Let me remind you of some things that we often hear. One, he destroyed the works of the enemy, 1 John 3, 8. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. He did that. He disarmed the enemy, Colossians 2, 5. 15. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them. How did he disarm them? Publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And then let me remind you of the greatest thing. He is greater than the enemy, stronger than the enemy. 1 John 4, 4. You dear children are far from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And then Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. Paul started us off this way weeks ago as we looked at it. And he reminds us, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler, authority, power, leader, or anything else, not only in this world, but also the world to come. Jesus is greater and stronger, and he took care of death and sin and has given us life. So what do we do? These two things, let me give you two things really to do today, this week, maybe you practice it in some way. One, the Bible teaches us to clothe ourselves with Jesus. You could even say, put on Jesus as armor. As followers of him, we put him on. Romans 13, 12 through 14. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes. Put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, immoral living, quarreling, jealousy. And that's just a small little part of a giant list of things that the enemy uses as footholds, snares, traps to pull us away from the purposes of God and the life God has for us. And and then Paul writes in Romans, clothe yourself with the presence of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day, we want to put on Jesus, be in his presence, speak to him, let him speak to us. That is going to make a difference. I wonder what that would look like for you today. In fact, we'll talk about it this week and again, the upcoming weeks. 
Uh, but clothe yourself with Jesus. Enter into times of honest prayer and reading his word, engaging with others, talking with those even online right now. Whatever you need to do, clothe yourselves with the presence of Jesus. And then there's this. Before I pray, if you have never, we say this every week, submitted your life to Christ, made a decision to follow him, today, if you're ready, is the day. Maybe you say this, I'm caught, I'm ensnared, I'm trapped. I need Jesus. The Bible says in James 4, 7, so humble yourselves. So this is where you come humbly before him, submitting to him. So humble yourselves before God. Then it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I thought this is interesting. And then I'll pray. It doesn't say resist the devil and he will flee from you and then come humbly before God. The place to start is with God. Humbly come before him. I'm caught. Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. I want to follow you. Say those words today and let us know if you have. Let us know through our platforms that you've given your life to Jesus, surrendered to him, or how you clothe yourself with him every day or where you need help. Let me, let me pray. Father, thank you so much for today, for these words. We recognize we are in a battle, but you are greater. We recognize the strategies and ways of the enemy, but Jesus, you are grander. You've taken care of death and sin, and uh, you give us the opportunity and, and uh, uh, this, this desire that you have for us to be in the presence with us on a daily basis. So help us clothe ourselves with you daily. And then we humbly come before you, God, knowing that we are not you, that we can only fight this battle in your strength. And for those today that have found themselves ensnared, captured, caught, Lord, we ask for freedom for them. As they humbly come to you, Jesus, ask for your help, surrender to you, free the captive. That's what you came to do. Thank you. And we love you. And it's your name. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, I love you guys. We miss you tremendously. You matter to us. And uh, we want to continue to make a difference. So thank you. God bless you guys.